In 1821, the quarterly musical magazine and review sounded the alarm bell for composers. In an article simply titled Melzel's Metronome, we read the following, and I quote, In the progress of art, the English instrumentalists are said to have accelerated the time of everything they play. What opened their eyes or ears was the presence of Raphael Georg Giesewetter coming over from Vienna to conduct the London Philharmonic Society's orchestra and works of Beethoven and Haydn. And that appearance must have caused a shock, a confrontation almost. A confrontation between tradition and progress, between clarity and rage for rapidity. And no surprise, the latter would win. Kiesewetter's time was up. And Beethoven, he freaked out. If there is one persistent view on the 19th century that keeps coming back and blocks every attempt to reconstruct what composers really had in mind, it is the idea that Beethoven played his works faster than we do today. So, faster than, for instance, this. Anyway, the musical reality of those days was another one than often is claimed by modern scholarship. As with all other aspects of life, also music, and especially musical performances, were dragged along with the dominating call for progress. Steam engines changed the world, electricity even more. And still today, the focus of making things better, faster, more powerful, is something that is in the center of society. Looking back to what was a reality in history, with the clear idea of reconstructing it, is still very new. And perhaps that's the reason we still struggle so much to be in a way uncompromisable to the outcome of our experiments. So back to 1821. Our friend Giesewetter raises the baton to conduct one of the best orchestras of its time. What happened and what was said was important enough for the quarterly musical magazine and review to spend an entire article, not on the performance, but on tempo. Five years after first publishing the famous Melzer directions, of which I'm preparing, by the way, a complete new and updated context that you'll get soon, the article republishes the full text of it again. But in the preface to the directions, it becomes clear why that is necessary. We take some blame to ourselves that we have so long let go by the desire we have entertained to speak of the utility of this instrument. Not only is the metronome useful as an inflexible monitor to practice, but its importance for composers lays elsewhere. But we are at length led to believe it may not be quite useless to draw the general attention more strongly towards it, by the fact that composers are still too often content with marking their notes only with the common terms, and to leave that execution of them to chance or discretion, although it's now completely within their power to define, with the nicest precision, their own intentions as to time, perhaps the first and most important part of expression. Indeed, changing tempo changes everything. You've heard me saying this a lot of times, and here you have it in a quote from 1821. But why should composers suddenly feel so urged to use the metronome more often? What happened? Were musicians not capable anymore to read the score? Reason was, they didn't care anymore about what the composer had in mind. It is also now more momentous than ever, because in the progress of art, the English instrumentalists are said to have accelerated the time of everything they play beyond the usage of other nations. Well, that's pretty clear. The musicians didn't play slower, they played faster. How much? We learn further in the article. First, we get to know how they got to this conclusion. Mr. Kiesewetter, in leading Beethoven's and Haydn's symphonies at the Philharmonic concert, we understand, 
insisted strongly upon their being played slower than that orchestra had been accustomed to perform them. So there you have a guy from Vienna, the Vienna still of Beethoven, that stands before the London Orchestra and felt the need to make a speech on Tempo, 1821. Next year, that will be 200 years ago, Kiesewetter would probably have started a YouTube channel today similar to mine. Anyways, let's listen to the pre-1821 generation of musicians. We have heard very old and very able musicians mention that the rage for rapidity is of late become so great as sometimes to perplex even first-rate violinists if they happen not to be thoroughly acquainted with the passage. In other words, the tempi taken were not a tiny bit too fast, they made retired professional musicians stand perplexed and not seldom embarrassed even the still performing musicians to a degree as to doubt whether they would be still able to play all of that. It also means all of that happened in one single generation, almost overnight. And so the reason why the metronome again was put front and center in this article is clear now. These are new phenomena, which may assist in enforcing the necessity and the utility of a definitive measure of time. In other words, it's a strong call for more metronome marks. And what did Beethoven do? He took his metronome. Even three months before his death, in December 1826, he wrote this to his publisher, Schott. The metronome markings will be sent to you very soon. Do wait for them. In our century, such indications are certainly necessary. Moreover, I have received letters from Berlin informing me that the first performance of the symphony, that's the ninth, was received with enthusiastic applause, which I ascribe largely to the metronome markings. We can scarcely have tempi ordinari anymore, since one must fall into line with the ideas of unfettered genius. Guys, this was Beethoven talking, not me. It becomes clear now why he as many other composers did give so many metronome marks. Progress of art was a force to reckon with. It wouldn't go away. The composer was no longer his own performer. And the new performer had to find its place, its status. Notice how this article described it as a fact, not all negative. Today we'd probably write Face it, Beethoven and others, the world has changed. But had those metronome marks the power to reverse this evolution? No, not at all. The composer's intention would remain disconnected from the performances. But exactly when, where and how much? We don't know. The London Music Society might very well have been the pinnacle of virtuosity in those days, as soon Paris would follow. Remember that in London a new star would raise at the horizon, that of Sir George Mart. I'll come back to him very soon, but a few more or less reliable facts about his performances as conductor point more in the direction of rage for rapidity than in the authentic Vienna tradition of Beethoven. It shouldn't surprise you that if you could time travel to London 1825, you already would hear the Beethoven symphonies played in a way very close to that of the Gardeners and Norringtons of today. Technically perhaps inferior, but fast for sure. Was it Beethoven's intention? No. Did the audience like it? Yes. It's important to realize this difference between the performance practice of that time and the composer's intention. And the more you dive in the 19th century performance practice, the more you will be aware of an enormous diversity, much more than today, but where the performers almost always had the last word on the music composed by others. Once you realize this, you might see also more clear of what our intentions are here on this channel. We are not trying to reconstruct what musicians made of Beethoven's music. The only thing that we are researching and experimenting with is the composer's intention. And even more specific, the tempo indication or metronome mark he gave for his score. We in fact are only reconstructing those five seconds of his life. 
all the rest is interesting, but not related. It is also, at least we see it that way, the most important practical indication for the performance of his work. The way he really wanted it to have, at least during those five seconds. It is what we called in a recent video list option number one. The authentic vision of the composer on his own work. The intention of the composer, who still was performer at the same time. And if anything, it is rather certain that in the entire 19th century that option was almost never heard anymore. This beautiful quote of 1821 is just one of many that simply say just that. Berlioz complained decades later was just a hit in the air. Tempo, he said, is a question of the composers, not of the conductor's feelings. But it was a battle that the composer had lost already decades before. And quite frankly, a battle we today have to fight for really hard still. Just scroll the comment section on our channel and you'll know. The list options, in case you've not seen that video, can be found here. It's an essential piece of the tempo puzzle for you to watch. As for now, thanks for watching, subscribe to this channel, make us continue on full speed by becoming a patron and we see each other very soon again. Bye.